Here we go again. As we know, over the past few years, there has been an increase and a, a rapid acceleration of racial tensions going on all across the West, not just in America, but in the UK as well. We constantly talk about how there's numerous ethnic enclaves that pop up all around the country. Cities in the UK are becoming less and less British by the year. And this causes tensions, this causes conflict that the ruling class, the government, want to exa exacerbate. They want to make it worse for everybody because they want conflict in the street. That's how I see it. They want the people who are native to European countries and those who are some of the founding stock of the US, for instance, those citizens, to be disenfranchised and understand that they are no longer in charge because, from my reading of the situation, that means that they pose less of a political threat to the, he threat to the hegemony that we exist in right now. And for a long time, since the George Floyd riots of 2020, the UK has been missing one pivotal piece, one final piece in the puzzle so that we can have all of the same racial tensions in the UK that they have over in the US, is that we have been missing a George Floyd. They are trying to rewrite our history in the same way that the 1619 Project tried to rewrite American history. That was a massive push by the New York Times, the big project where they got lots of historians to lie, and lots of historians have come out and proven that a lot of what they were saying were lies, so that's not a particularly controversial statement. Now we've got the BBC, Horrible Histories, lots of other... Um, pieces of media trying to rewrite our history so that we can insert Africans where there weren't any. Even we've spoken about Cheddar Man recently over the weekend. Even if Cheddar Man does turn out, if we can find a way to test DNA for skin pigmentation, even if it does turn out that he was darker than we would expect, it still doesn't make him African. They're trying to take our history and insist that we're all immigrants. We all have, we're all African down the line. Therefore, you have to accept mass immigration from third world countries, primarily coming from North and Sub-Saharan Africa, because that's what we're getting a lot. That's the people who are coming over the channel. Well, the claim made in that book that we covered, um, the one which um, the segment was titled um, Africa Stonehenge. Stonehenge, but the most egregious claim is that they were saying that the British Isles had been black for longer than it had been a white country. And they're basically trying to say that, hey, you're a guest in our country. That's a rather remarkable. It, well, they're saying we're usurpers, that in similar way that uh, Israel was reclaimed by the Jews, then UK should be up for grabs to be able to be reclaimed by those who it's a originally belonged. It's a casus belli, basically. It's a reason for conquest. It, it justifies why they can do this and why they can be horrible. Yes, but just over a year ago, it seemed that they had their their George Floyd moment. We finally had a George Floyd situation in the UK, in the center of London, where a black man, an unarmed black man, was shot and killed by a metropolitan police officer, which was absolute, this was Christmas for the elites, because that's exactly what they wanted so that they could push the racial grievance narrative. We've had lots of institutionalized racism talk going on in the police ever since Stephen Lawrence in the 1990s. But what they needed was a direct incident of a black man who is supposedly unarmed being assaulted and murdered by a police officer. They had one in 2011 as well. This was the catalyst for the 2011 London riots, which just happened a couple of roads away from where I grew up. And this is Mark Duggan, who was supposedly discarding of a handgun. I can't remember whether or not he actually had, but he had past convictions and he was shot because he was believed to have been armed. And the family came out and protested it and said that this was police violence. And then it turned into an excuse to ransack and loot JD Sports in Lewisham and Elton. Always happens. You can only feed your children if you're stealing the top, the top range Nike. That's the only thing that you can do. If I don't, if I can't steal a Rolex, how are my children supposed to live? I do remember a guy stealing a whole bag of basmati rice and posting it on Facebook, which obviously got him caught. Which was uh, very incredibly. Smart. They're not sending their best, yeah. Very smart. Uh, but what I'm going to do here, I'm going to explain to you what's been going on with the Metropolitan Police since the incident that occurred last September. I'm going to give you the context for that situation and tell you how the media, as they're reporting it right now, are leaving out a lot of crucial details that were reported by certain publications at the time, but were still ignored. The police themselves seem to be ignoring some of these crucial details, at least in the statements that they have released to the public. And then I'm going to give everybody a quick lesson. I've done this before. I've spoken about Chris Carver twice already, but... I'm going to give everybody a quick reminder of the music scene that he came from, which is specific to London, the drill rap scene, and the kind of environment and people that that creates. Before I do that, we've got lots of excellent videos on the website. We've had quite a few signups recently because we currently still have the promo code Sargon active. So if you go on uh, Stripe 
when you're signing up for the website and you use Sargon with an e promo the code, end. yes, with an E at the end, then that means that you'll be able to get 50% off your first three month subscription. Excellent deal. Honestly, we've got probably probably years worth of content on the nearly, website. Nearly three year point. anniversary. Yes. We have many long running series with like Josh's Contemplation has over 100 episodes. It's well worth your time. Approaching 150 now. Yeah. Getting to 150. We've got Epochs. And we also have, if we go back to it, Connor and I's Comics Corner. And this was the second part of a much anticipated series that we've been covering. The Zerk. We previously, for the sixth episode, did the Golden Age and Black Swordsman arc. This was the follow up to the conviction. Berserk being the only Japanese property that we have covered so far. It's been quite a hit. People really like it. I really love the series. And Connor is slowly managing to get into it as well as it starts to become a bit less grim, dark, and miserable. Bonnet's helped. Yes, and he's found his... Congratulations, guys. Connor finally has an anime waifu. So She just needed to be a <laughs> LARPing sadomasochistic drag calf. There you go. So if you'd like to check that video out, please go to the website, subscribe <laughs> subscribe for two hours of Connor realizing his inner weeaboo, and let's carry on, shall we? So the news that's coming out right now is that earlier on this week, the Metropolitan Police Officer who shot Chris Caber in the head, one shot, one kill, quite impressive, if we're perfectly honest. Let's not, I'm, not, I'm not going, you know, he's been arrested and charged with murder. So at the moment, they still have to prove it in a court of law. They still have to go all, through all the proceedings. But that's what's happened. And as a result, a lot of metropolitan police officers have said that they are going to refuse to carry their guns. It's now, also, sorry to cut you off. Um, go on. It's also worth mentioning as well that our armed response uh, units in Britain tend to be very well trained. They spend a lot of time yes. training rather than on the street. And then they're called out to specific operations a lot of the time. Of course, they'll, they'll still do things like um, walking around. Um, Potential like terrorist tar targets and things like that. So they'll be in like airports and outside parliament, as you said. But a lot of the time, they are specialising in being as good as possible. Most of them are so, ex-military. Yeah, well, yep. it's worth mentioning that there isn't necessarily this parallel between America, where I think some American police officers get thrown under the bus with very little training. And I think that actually a lot of the time, just training them to be better at their job could help. And it also means it's easier to defend them when something goes wrong, because you say, listen, we've put them through all of this training. You know, We've done everything we can to minimize the chance of accidentally shooting an innocent person. Well, as we'll go on to find out when we go through the details, I don't think anything was done wrong in the situation that the police officer found himself in. The fact that it was one shot and one kill is especially impressive. And it is just another case where the powers that be are taking a force that is supposed to be protecting the citizenry and it's, and it's uh, stripping away its powers to ensure that the kind of culture that Chris Caber came from, this drill gang, drill rap culture, can spread around and cause chaos for the people who are actually affected by it. They're the ones that have to face the consequences of increased crime. London is a city which has had exploding crime rates for years at this point, constantly rising year on year. And if this was 100 years ago, and we were still under the Robert Peel police system in London, where there was very, very low crime rates, people weren't expected to be going around shooting and stabbing one another in the streets, then perhaps, you know, a situation like this wouldn't cause a problem. But in London right now, which is in parts of it, essentially um, a subdued war zone. Um, don't go to Woodgreen. Just don't, don't do it. And don't really go around Brixton. In fact, I've got a map at the end of this where it'll show you specific areas where you should, probably shouldn't go unless you're in a large group of people that you can trust and rely on. Anyway, I'll read through some of this article to give you the proper details. So on Thursday, and this was Thursday last week now, an armed officer who's only been identified as NX121 appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court and also the Old Bailey charged with murdering Mr. Cabra on September 5th last year. He was given conditional bail and is expected to stand trial next year. Highly trained officers working for SCO19, the specialist firearms unit, told their bosses they were no longer willing to carry uh, guns the day after a Met officer appeared, blah, blah, blah. Um, they described Chris Cabber here as an unarmed black man who was shot dead in South London last September. And unarmed is a nice malleable term because if you're wielding a car with the chance to run someone over, can you really be classified as unarmed? But it's nice and malleable and vague enough that you can make that argument. The Met has more than 3,000 firearms officers across a number of units, but the loss of so many at once has led to concern over the ability of the force to meet its duties and keep the public safe. One source said these officers are highly trained professionals who take their role and responsibilities extremely seriously. Because, as we talked about, these are men who, at, at the base of it, if you join the police force, you want to keep people safe. 
And that's what these people want to do. They go into the firearms because they know that they will be very specialist and they will only be needed in specific situations, but they do not go in with the intention or desire to just wantonly murder people. So I know they someone, want to keep people safe. I know someone who does a lot of engineering work inside many police stations to the point where they have a routine Met Police pass. And they were speaking to me yesterday and they said there are upwards of a thousand firearm officer incidents every year, but they only usually result in one or two kills. And it's because they have such trigger discipline and they are so well coordinated that usually these sorts of interactions are not necessary. So what was the trigger for this interaction? As you said, it was the possibility that one of the officers could be hit by the car. At that point, it is a reasonable use of force. I think it's also worth mentioning as well that lots of the people that aspire to get into these armed response units are the people who don't want to do all the petty nonsense like um, he's... He said, she said on Arresting Twitter. Arresting an autistic girl for insulting yeah, her, saying she looks like a lesbian. They're actually dealing with, you know, violent organized crime and Terrorism. you know, terrorists. These are two things that I feel like are very uncontroversial to deal with. And so they feel like, well, of course I'm doing good now. I'm not necessarily persecuting people for voicing their opinions. I'm dealing with terrorists and, and drug dealers and, and violent criminals. So there's sort of a selection pressure that pushes people in that area of policing to be, you know, they're, they're selected to be good people a lot mm. of the time. Obviously, you can't generalize, but on yeah. the whole, I can, I can certainly You're identify... You're going to people the benefit of the doubt. Most, yes. most, of, most of the time, I will say, of course, the Sarah Everard guy who was covered up for was an arm... He, he did spend time in the armed response unit. There will be people that slip through the net. However, yes, the rigorous training and the nature of the work does pre-select for officers who are more competent and show more restraint. Yes. Carrying on, the statement continues saying they're simply no longer willing to take the risk of going to work with all of the dangers that represents and also run the risk of being charged with murder. Lots of them have simply had enough and they're saying it's just not worth it anymore because realistically, the incentives that are being set are if you do your job properly and actually keep people safe, you will be the one going to court over this. So what is the point? Because not only are you going to bring ruin to your own life, you'll be bringing financial ruin to your family's life with whatever legal costs you might be saddled with and the fact that if you do get put away, your family don't have you to rely on anymore and you become a pariah in the community when you get out, your name will be smeared for all time forevermore. You will be that racist murdering police officer. Nobody wants that. So why would they carry on with their job the way that they're setting up right now? Just hours after he appeared in court, a Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Commissioner, had a meeting with around 70 firearms officers concerned about the development. He issued a statement which said they were understandably anxious as they consider how others may assess their split-second decisions years after the event, with the luxury of as much time as they want to do this and the effect that this can have on them and their families. So with the police, seemingly a, a significant portion of them, handing in their firearms, Who's going to take the place? Because London, as I've mentioned, is quite a dangerous place in some areas. Well, it looks as though the Metropolitan might be bringing in some military support, potentially as and when they need it, which might not work that well because, <laughs> as we mentioned, a lot of these firearms officers are the ones who are going to have been potentially previously in the military anyway. But the sort of training and uh, situations you're trained to respond to in the military are different than in an urban setting in London. You don't know what's going to happen there. But, you know, let's, let's see what they say. The MOD said it received a request known as the Military Aid to the Civil Authorities from the Home Office to provide routine counterterrorism contingency support to the Metropolitan Police should it be needed. The Met said it was a contingency option that would be used in specific circumstances and where an appropriate policing response was not available. Military staff would not be used in routine policing capacity, it added. But if a situation where violence does begin to erupt on the streets happened, I feel as though the military support that comes in will not be uh, will be might be a bit more dangerous for the people engaging in the mm -hmm. violence than if it was the firearms officer. Well, it's less so less so the people engaging in the violence because putting it frankly, if you're rioting in the streets, I don't care about the the danger posed to you. You're already a criminal. You you forfeit your own life. I'm concerned about the possibility of civilian civilian casualties because again, the firearms officers are more trained to be to have higher trigger discipline in an urban environment, whereas the military are more adapted to different warfare tactics. It is, so they might not be properly equipped to do uh, to deal with this, in this, London as they would in Baghdad. Also, this isn't to say anything negative about the military nope. forces. This is speculation on our part, just from tangential knowledge. It is worth mentioning that the military have their own military police as well. And um, I, I would imagine that they would be the most sort of suited to replacing regular police, wouldn't they? Because they're already 
in a sort of policing role. But it is also worth mentioning that they're used to policing people in the military. And so they're used to policing trained killers, aren't they? Mm. And they're not necessarily used to um, dealing with civilians. So if there are circumstances where there are um, civilians caught in a crossfire, it may be that they don't have as much experience as, say, the proper armed response police. And reserve levels are at the lowest they've been since the Napoleonic Wars. So do we really need to stress our military capacity anymore by depleting the number of armed officers that should be dealing with different jobs? It's just ridiculous. It's an excellent question. But what statements did the police make? Well, let's read it out because they included it in the IOPC statement on the website because the IOPC are the ones who've been looking into this for the past year or so. And uh, the summary of events is comprehensive enough, but as we'll find out, missing some crucial context here, which I hope is going to be looked into from some of the reporting that was done closer to the time when the shooting had just occurred, reported by The Telegraph and The Evening Standard um, when they were reporting it. And I hope that if there's going to be a con uh, an actual comprehensive investigation done into it, that they follow up on these statements that were made by anonymous individuals for those papers, because otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have the full story, because what they've put here is comprehensive enough, but not the full story. On Monday, the 5th of September, 2022, Mr. Chris Cabber was driving an Audi motor vehicle in South London. The Audi Mr. Cabber was driving was believed to be linked to a firearms incident, which took place the previous day, and an automatic number plate recognition marker had been placed upon it. Briefing was provided to officers prior to their shift on the 5th of September in which the Audi was brought to their attention as potentially being associated with the firearms incident the previous day. Mr. Cabba's name was not included in the briefing because the car was not registered under his name in the first place. Why was he driving it? According to police logs and accounts received to date by officers, the Audi was recognized by officers parked at the side of the A202 in Camberwell Green in an unmarked armed response vehicle. The officers then started to follow the vehicle and circulated this via police airwaves at around 9.52. Officers continued to follow the Audi until 10.07. The officers did not activate their lights or sirens while following the vehicle. The intention was to use an enforced stop extraction on the Audi. That makes perfect sense because you don't know if he's carrying a firearm or not. Yes, it's related to a firearms incident. You can't trust the situation isn't going to escalate, especially around the streets of London. If you end up getting into a high-speed chase, there could be some bad casualties that result from that. At around 10.07, Mr. Crabber took, made a left turn from the New Park Road into Kirkstall Gardens. Already present on Kirkstall Gardens was a marked police armed response vehicle. The marked ARV had parked on Kirkstall Gardens with the intention of joining the other police officers behind the Audi once it had passed the junction. One of the officers inside the marked ARV was NX121, the one who's been charged. Once Mr. Cabot made a left turn, the decision was taken to perform an inline extraction. Armed officers exited their vehicles and approached the Audi. The evidence suggests that contact was made between the Audi driven by Mr. Cabot and the police vehicles. So he drove it into the police car? Yes. The evidence further suggests that Officer NX, uh, NX121 was standing to the front of Mr. Carver's vehicle, so in direct... In, in, direct, um, in the like, path of the vehicle. In the path of the vehicle, so he could have been hit. A single shot was fired from the officer, piercing the front windscreen of the vehicle that Mr. Carver was driving and struck him. Officers at the scene provided first aid to Mr. Carver before he was taken to Co King's College Hospital, where he's pronounced dead at 12.16 a.m. on Tuesday, the 6th of September. So they tried to save his life. So they did try to save his life, but once again, seems that only one shot was fired, one shot hit, and that's all the job that needed doing. But that's like some proper Clint Eastwood. It, like, it really is. One shot. Fast draw. Yeah. One shot, one kill. But as I mentioned, this is missing context. So if we go to the Telegraph article that was released on the 7th of September last year, it says here, locals described how the police used their own cars to box in the Audi Q8 while shouting at the driver to get out. Witnesses claimed the driver ignored police requests to give himself up, so he had plenty of opportunity. And when he attempted to ram his way out of the roadblock, officers opened fire. So once again, unarmed doesn't mean that he didn't have possession of anything that could be used to kill you, because this might shock some people watching. An Audi Q8 going at high enough speed could easily kill someone, even not even necessarily high enough speed, just ramming into you repeatedly to try and get out. Unarmed just means we didn't think he had a gun in his hand at the time. So as I understand the situation then, there was an officer in between the Audi and a police car that had blocked him in in front in between the two there. That's what it sounds like. So he would have been sandwiched in between two vehicles if, if he had successfully hit the officer. Situation and, that could easily kill someone. And yes. also, Kaber was able to see the armed officer holding the gun. So he took the gamble to drive at the officer holding up. What did you expect? 
genuinely, what is going through your mind when someone's aiming a gun at you, telling you not to drive, and you floor it? Yes, and there's there's a lot more information giving some context in this Telegraph article because then they try with the sub story, the sub story that leads to images like if I go this one, the one that everybody has seen as Chris Carber at this point. Justice for Chris Carbo because we managed to find one soppy photo of him looking happy and smiling, which proves that he was a good boy who didn't do nothing. If Criminals we, have never smiled. Just, just like, you, yeah, you can find pictures of Al Capone with a big grin on his face. You could probably find pictures of Robert Mugabe with a big grin on his face. This doesn't stop them from having been very, very bad people. In the context that gives here, he was an expectant father who was due to get married in January. Keep a hold of that information. He was understood to be a member of a drill rap collective known as 67, who were nominated as best newcomer in the 2016 Music of Black Origin MOBO Awards. Formed in Brixton and Herne Hill areas of South London, members of the 67 group were linked to a Country Lines drug dealing operation in county, 2019. By the way. Oh, yes, uh, County, yes, with 16 members j- uh, jailed for a collective total of 61 years. Mr. Cabo was also with the group when they performed on the TV channel of the controversial former BBC DJ Tim Westwood. Thank you, Mr. Westwood for platforming criminals. Mr. Kaba himself was also jailed in 2019 after being convicted of fi- uh, possessing a firearm with intent to cause fear of violence. So if they did know he was behind the vehicle of the vehicle registered to a firearm incident, they could have looked him up and gone, right, he's had a firearm before and he's been in prison for it. The car is linked to a firearm incident. It's probable that he's got a gun. And there's more in the Evening Standard article that we'll get to in a moment that proves that he's, a, he's just of a violent disposition in the first place. They say in here, drill rap music has been criticized by police for stoking violence with rival gangs often goading each other in lyrics that are posted on social media. By that, as we'll find out, they literally mean they will kill someone and wear a mask in a music video, bragging about it, and post it to YouTube. That's what they do. This incident follows the murders of two drill rappers in recent days with 21-year-old Takayo Nemard stabbed to death at the Notting Hill Carnival, hmm, pretty common occurrence there, and 29-year-old Maximilian Kusi, Kusi Owusu gunned down in West Kensington. And this is one of those fine gentlemen who ended up murdered. I think this is the one who died at Notting Hill Carnival. And this is even more information from the time, Evening Standard. And once again, for the police investigation and the legal investigation that's going to be going on with this trial next year, I want them to follow up on all of these anonymous claims that were made in these articles that the journalists spoke to people at the incident who say things like this. An anonymous witness later told the standard, armed police jumped out and were shouting at the man, get out of the car, at least a dozen times. The guy in the car had a lot of opportunities to stop, but he refused. He then started driving towards a police car and smashed into it, then reversed. He just wouldn't stop the vehicle. So this isn't even really a case like George Floyd where there's some ambiguity in it because of the fact that it looked to me, it wasn't proven in a court of law, but it looked a lot to me like he was going through a fentanyl overdose that Derek Chauvin didn't really have much to do with. This was a clear incident of this man was attacking police officers. He could have had the opportunity to get out of the car, not escalate the situation, and then he could complain on social media the day after that police pointed a gun at him because he was a black guy and would have got a Telegraph article, would have got Daily Mail, would have got the BBC interview anyway. But no, he instead chose to try and ram his way out of the situation and got shot. On the graph of F around to find out, I'd say he's a 10. Mm-hmm. It's also worth mentioning as well, if you're driving a car that's not registered in your name, that's still illegal. So mm. he, even if he was unarmed, he had still broken the law. And clearly he was so concerned about this minor charge that he was willing to ram into a police officer. It would probably have violated his parole conditions, wouldn't it? That's mm. probably true as well, yeah. So the resident also claimed that Kaba could have killed one of the officers with his car, clearly. Ms. Riberio Addy below says the car was not registered to Mr. Cabra and wonders if the police even knew he was the driver. Last weekend's rallies were held outside New Scotland Yard, Met's headquarters with other protests taking place in Brighton, Manchester and Cardiff, all for this sweet angel, this sweet baby boy who just happened to try and kill some police officers. Mourners were told Mr. Cabra's pregnant fiance, Karima Waite, was so grief stricken she could hardly get out of bed. Star Wars actor John Boyega highlighted the case on New York's Hot 97 radio station while discussing institutional racism, the institutional racism of police officers defending themselves in a life or death situation. Vossy bop rapper Stormzy, another worthless human being, offered his support to Mr. Carver's family at a time when the Queen's death overtook the musicians in the news. What's Vossy bop? Uh, I don't know. I'm maybe a region where he's from. 
All I know is Stormzy, if you're stoking this sort of thing, I'm not surprised at all. At the time, here's a fun one. Mr. Carver had only recently been released from a four-year term in a young offender institution for possession of the firearm, intent to cause fear of violence. The conviction dated to an incident in Butchers Road, Canning Town, 2017. With that incident, we already mentioned in the previous one, they expand on it here. Police said that gunshots were fired, but no one was injured. So it was not even a situation where he was just waving a gun around like an idiot. He, he was actually involved in a situation, whether it was him firing or not, where shots were fired. Fantastic. Following his sentence, Mr. Cabo was released around a year ago, but by April 13th of 2022, freed Mr. Cabo was served by the police with a 28-day domestic violence protection order related to Ms. Waite, the mother of his unborn girl. The notice granted at Westminster Magistrates Court barred him from contacting her on social media or entering her street in Battersea. So what a saint. From the understanding that I get from that, it sounds as though he may have been beating his pregnant, his pregnant fiance. fiance. What a scumbag. Yes, absolute scumbag. It added the order prohibits the alleged perpetrator from using or threatening violence against her uh, or pestering, encouraging, or instructing the other people to do so. However, Ms. Waite's mother, Kim Alain, 49, said her future son-in-law had an apprenticeship to become an architect. And literally, you can look into this whenever an incident like this happens. For some reason, it's always reported. Simon Webb did a YouTube video on this. It's quite remarkable. Every single one of these young black men who gets into an altercation with the police or some kind of violent encounter with gangs who dies was always an apprenticeship to become an architect. Very strange. It's funny that in the 20th century, you needed to be worried about the failed artists. Now it's the failed architects. <laughs> yeah, but architect, architect just means I defaced the side of a leisure center with graffiti once. That's about it. And even then, he was only an apprentice. Uh, but she added, he was so loved. He was so funny. He was super kind. If it's a white boy, he would have got a chance to get out of the car. He did. He had 12. He did. He had 12, at least 12, and instead chose to drive into the officer. So it sounds a lot like it was his fault. And I'm not saying that he deserved it. I'm saying that he put himself in a situation where it ended up happening. I think he absolutely deserved it. He's a career criminal. He decided to try and kill a police officer. He's a moron. Oh, and even more fun. There might be a reason. One of the uh, Here's something else that might make you think to yourself, maybe we didn't lose a Christian saint here. Okay. Which was that it was reported earlier this year in April, and I only just learned about this the other day, that there were men in court over an alleged murder plot with Chris Carver earlier this year. So this is interesting, and it was almost certainly what part of the reason that the police, uh, that the car the police were monitoring was being monitored in the first place. Uh, they say here, a group of men have appeared at the Old Bailey accused of plotting with Chris Caber to murder another young man. The offence relates to a shooting in Hackney Road in Tower Hamlets, East London, on August 30th last year, in which the victim survived. This sounds a lot like the firearms-related incident that this was all going off the back of in the first place, bearing in mind that the incident with Caber took place on the 5th of September. This is, what, five or six days prior to it. This car was being looked into. So the car that they list in this uh, that related to it was a Range Rover, but still, these people who were all involved in it, the car might have belonged to one of them, that Audi Q8. On Friday, Shamaya Bell, Hamza Abdi, spot any classic British names here, if you will, Connell Bamboy- Bangboye and Simeon Glasgow, <laughs> interesting, appeared at the Old Bailey by video link from Thameside and High Down Prisons. The other two defendants, Marcus Pottinger, 20, from Brixton, and Carl Tago, 28, of no fixed address. That's a good sign. Yeah, you don't hear that very often anymore, at least not outside of Brixton, were not required to attend the hearing. According to the indictment, all six men are accused of conspiring together and with with Mr. Cabot to murder Brendan Malucci on August 30th last year. The second charge alleges that they conspired together with Mr. Cabot to cause grievous bodily harm to Mr. Malucci. They are further charged with possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life and with intent to cause fear of violence on Hackney Road in Tower Hamlets on the same day. So this is almost certainly the incident in the first place that had meant that uh, the car was being tracked. And secondly, this just means that Cabba was a violent criminal by the sounds of it. It sounds like whatever happened, he would have had another run-in with the police if he hadn't been careful anyway because they would have ended up bringing him into court for this. Plotting to murder someone qualifies someone as a violent person. Yes. As well as shooting a gun off. I would All say. right, take that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but as mentioned, he was part of a 67 drill, gra- uh, d- drill 
drill rap group slash gang. This is just what they do. Like, here's the leader of 67 in an interview that he did with Dazed, because, of course, you never have any, any end to platforms and publications that are willing to speak to these people and glorify and excuse what it is they do. I'll just read some choice excerpts from this article of uh, where they were talking to LD, the leader of 67. Interviewing a drill rapper can be nerve-wracking. Aside from the obvious menace upon which the genre thrives, your first challenge is that most are KG facing, facing up to questions. Then there's the issue of ops. Most drill rappers have fierce rivals. Mention them and you're in dangerous waters, open to accusations of trivializing life and death conflict as though discussing a soap opera. That's because your lives are so stupid and ridiculous. LD is impossibly laid back for a man serving his sixth stint in prison in 28. Now, this is not Chris Cabber himself. This is just the guy who ran the gang that Chris Cabber was a part of. So you, you don't, don't judge Cabber entirely from this, but just maybe associations, birds of a feather, etc. LD was sentenced to four and a half years in December 2019 because of the conspiracy to supply crack, uh, heroin and crack cocaine across county lines. LD says his own lyrics were used against him as part of the prosecution. <gasps> I bragged about the crimes that I committed and they used it as evidence against me. What a stupid thing. With lines like, on the way to a show now and I'm sm still smelling of the bando, on the moats with ASAP making sweeter drinks than mango. What? What, uh, what, what poetry. Yeah, what poetry indeed. Sorry. Shakespeare would be... Uh, <laughs> it's like audible hieroglyphics. What does that even mean? I'm honestly despondent that the English language gets used for this drivel. So, but uh, from LD and R Dizzy Rascals, oh, he's collaborated with Dizzy Rascals. What? Fantastic. <laughs> Stepped in a bando is a drug dealer's base. Being presented, that was presented as evidence in court. I was just laughing, says LD. They're just lyrics. Until you can show me evidence, which is facts, it's just lyrics, which makes it fictional. Well, it seems like you went down for this, so they must have proved it with evidence. So don't know what you're laughing about. Wasn't Dizzy Rascal recently in court for something? I can't remember exactly what it Shop. is, but I, I don't <laughs> want to be wrong here. Please correct me in the comments. I think it's Well, you might think do... he's bonkers, but I just think he's free. Get out of here. I heard John really? laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't remember. I, it might have been something to do with an accusation that his former girlfriend made. So I'm happy to be corrected on that. Oh, but dear. all of these people all being connected, it doesn't smack of no. being good. Yeah, no. so... Uh, carries on, but Jules' insidious side remains. The most rabid fans still post scoreboards on social media, awarding points to artists based on real-life acts of violence, including murder. It's attempting to uh, conclude that authentic references to violence, drillings, are what makes drill drill. In the 2019 Vice documentary, JMs, a rapper from Sydney's 1-4, declares, what makes us a drill group is that we actually do what we rap about. Does LD agree with that definition? So what this article is trying to do is saying they actually go to prison for committing crimes. They then brag about these crimes. They post their crimes on social media with scoreboards of their opponents that they have murdered. But can we really believe them? What if they're actually just a bunch of innocent people who've what if been unfairly just... strung up by an institutionally racist system? What if they're just architecture students? Yeah, what if the architects could be here? <laughs> anyway, and there's loads of articles always talking about it. You've got The Sun with a, very, a remarkably comprehensive article discussing a lot of the drill war, turf wars that were going on back in 2018 and prior to that. You've got incidents like this, eight West London gang members, drill music videos, sentence after stabbing that teen, uh, after a stabbing, this is a terribly formatted headline, Stabbing that left a teen with life-threatening injuries. They didn't kill anybody, but you can be goddamn sure that they tried to. This is so widespread and so well-known that the Genius website has this page, Drill Gangs, Allies and Enemies, where I can just I can scroll through. OFB, whoever they are, if I click on this, Genius Annotation, scroll down. Oh, wait, no, some of them don't have their Allies and Enemies listed, but on a few of them, you do. So if I go down... Just click through randomly some of them. Yes, and here you go. Allies, loose ties to Harlem Spartans and active gang with an X. Enemies, most gangs, including 674. Guess who they are? 67. Oh, right. It's not yeah. quite the Montagues and the Capulets, is it? No, no. This is quite remarkable. that You can claim that these people are just good boys who didn't do nothing, while a milk toast music website that posts lyrics like Genius 
has a complete rundown of who these gangs are and who their enemies are. I like how there's a gang just called 150. Yeah, that's what they do. They just have really <laughs> bad names. Just numbers. Yep. And to make it even worse, because of the fact that we know the crimes these people commit, they brag about them in music videos, and then they post these music videos online. To make it even worse that why the police don't just go in and arrest most of these people, they have a map. They have a map of London on the UK Drill website that tells you... One is one right near me. Yep. Look, I've been around Brixton before. I've parked my car around here. I didn't know I was parking it in the territory of YND MFL. So you might want to go into the description and check out this website if you're, on, if you're in London because it might be good and useful to help you stay safe at night, to be perfectly honest, because you might want to avoid all of these highlighted areas. But yeah, Chris Cabber was no saint. As Connor said, as much as I hate to say it, because I know that he was a good boy who was trying to do nothing, it seemed that he got what he deserved for the situation that he put himself in. And for the love of God, Met Police, do not charge this man. I know he's already been charged with murder. Give him a fair trial. Acquit him. We do not want the UK Derek Chauvin. If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast of The Low Seaters, why not visit our website where you can get the podcast live, in full, uncensored and for free from 1 o'clock UK time every weekday. And while you're there, for as little as £5 a month, you can access all of our paywalled premium content, such as this interview I did with author Doug Stokes about his recent book, Against Decolonization. And if you'd like to follow what we're putting out, you can follow me on Twitter at at con underscore Tomlinson and the rest of us over at at lotuseaters underscore com. Until next time, goodbye.